All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ishan, and for the second half of today's lecture, we're going to be looking at a class of models called deep generative models. So in this class, uh, so far, until this point, for the most part, we've been looking at uh, classes of models that use neural networks to interpret data. Uh, most recently images, and then before that uh, sequences, for example, of text, uh, but really any sort of arbitrary, complicated, high-dimensional data. Uh, and we've been looking at how we can use neural networks to take that data as input specifically, uh, and then perform some kind of complicated sequential computation on it, uh, but then the output has been more or less something reasonably simple. Uh, it's been uh, a probability distribution over classes for the most part. Uh, labels, uh, whether a digit is 0, 1, 2, 3, up to through 9. Um, but now I want to take a look at sort of the inverse problem, uh, which is how can we get neural networks to output things that are really complicated? Um, how can we get them to uh, run backwards, so to speak, and, and generate uh, images in this case, uh, but really all sorts of things, uh, rather than just being able to look at images and interpret them? So this is the target that we're going to build towards. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art generative model uh, that's able to generate uh, a wide diversity of, of pictures within each class, and then uh, a wide variety of classes from the ImageNet data set which Lex talked to you about previously today. Um, and as you can see, the generations end up being quite varied, and they're also uh, quite, quite true to the form of what they're supposed to be. Uh, so these are, these are pictures of, I think, uh, birds, ants, monasteries, and volcanoes. Uh, the volcanoes look pretty. The other ones, well, it's trying. Um, so we can generate images. We can also uh, use generative models to generate speech. Uh, this is, this is the classic problem of speech synthesis and of getting computers to talk. Um, and recently, what's cool is that, uh, like in a lot of other fields, deep neural networks have gotten to the point where we can just feed them uh, a really large data set of, in fact, raw audio waveforms without doing any sort of pre-processing on them. Uh, and a sufficiently big generative model will learn the statistical properties of these waveforms and be able to generate uh, audio that sounds just like it, uh, that's actually convincingly human sounding. Um, so speech synthesis is another important application for generative modeling. Uh, besides that, we can generate things like handwriting. Um, we can feed in a sequence of pen strokes, uh, have a neural network learn what those pen strokes look like, and then ask it to produce more similar looking pen strokes. And we can get neural networks to handwrite convincingly that way. Uh, and the final interesting modality that we might want to talk about is language. Um, if we, if we think about uh, sequences of text as our, our complicated input that we want to actually output, um, then we can train neural networks to generate sequences of text, uh, just again by giving them lots of text to look at. Uh, and we can use this to uh, do uh, things like what are called conversational agents or dialogue agents. Uh, that's what this is an example of. Um, where uh, you'll have a human say something, um, uh, like give a, a sequence of text, and then you'll ask the machine to produce uh, whatever the, uh, a reasonable response to that sequence of text might be. Um, and you train this model on a big corpus of, uh, I, I think in this case it is, uh, tech support chat logs. And as you can see, the machine actually ends up doing a reasonably good job of emulating a tech support agent. Um, Besides uh, conversation, um, machine translation is another important application of generative modeling of text. Uh, so you can think of the problem of translating a sentence uh, from, say, English to French as the problem of generating a French sentence conditioned on its English translation. Um, so you have machine translation, uh, you have dialogue, and these are important examples of why uh, being able to generate text with neural networks is, is an exciting application of generative models. So generating things is cool. Uh, and there are a lot of really interesting applications in the short term for generative models. But 
there's, a, there's something slightly more fundamental that we're trying to get at here, actually, uh, when we do research on generative models. Uh, and that is the idea that through learning to generate something, you learn to understand the properties of the data that you're generating. Um, and, and what I mean by this is, uh, say you are tasked with uh, uh, generating pictures of bedrooms. Um, in order to do a convincing job of generating a, a picture of a bedroom without simply memorizing your training set, uh, your model has to have internalized a notion of what a bedroom is. And in doing so, uh, it has to, it, it's, its picture of what a bedroom is has to be complete uh, in the sense that every characteristic that pictures of bedrooms have, your model has to learn. Uh, because if it forgets to learn even one, then the generations that come out the other end uh, will look like unconvincing bedrooms in that respect. Um, now, again, I'm being a, a little bit vague about what specifically it means to understand. Uh, so I'll try to give some examples here uh, to better illustrate this concept. Um, one important downstream application of generative models uh, is that they're able to assist in classification. So we can take the classification problem that we've been looking at uh, pretty much up till now in this course, uh, and we can ask, how can we make this better through the use of a generative model? Uh, how can uh, a sort of understanding of the data uh, help us to better build classifiers for it? So this is a picture of two data points in some hypothetical space. And we train a classifier on these two data points um, to label the, the black one as black and the white one as white, say. Um, and our classifier draws a decision boundary in what looks like a pretty sensible place. Um, but we can actually do a lot better than this uh, if we know something about uh, the, the shape of the distribution that this data comes from. Uh, and that's what this right picture is. Uh, as soon as we know a little bit about uh, the distribution of data, um, we can leverage that even if these other data points that we're given don't have class labels associated with them. Uh, we now have a much better intuition as to where we want to draw our decision boundary. Uh, and we can train a classifier like this uh, that's much more likely to generalize better to new data uh, because it knows sort of what the, the, the shape or the manifold of the data that it's looking at uh, looks like. Um, this comes up a lot, actually, uh, in speech recognition, where uh, the way that computers do speech recognition right now uh, is very heavily biased uh, towards looking at the acoustic properties of data. Um, it, it, we've built neural networks that are very, very good at uh, reading audio waveforms or spectrograms or, or other audio features and outputting some kind of transcription. Um, but the way that humans do speech recognition uh, actually relies a lot less on uh, being very, very good at discriminating between subtle features in the audio that we hear uh, and very, very good um, at being able to infer what people might have said uh, based on what kinds of things are plausible in context. Um, that is, uh, in our heads, we have sort of a generative model of what valid sentences might look like given a certain conversation. Uh, and we are in the background applying that generative model as a, as a sort of prior on what the reasonable outputs uh, for the internal speech recognizers in our heads are. Uh, for instance, in this conversation I'm having about speech recognition with you guys, uh, if I were to say uh, that it is a very challenging task, in fact, to recognize speech, um, you would be forgiven uh, for interpreting what I just said as it is a very challenging task to recognize speech. Uh, in fact, I said wreck a nice beach, um, which is entirely a different sentence. Uh, so classification is an important application of generative models. Um, another one is representation learning. We've talked about representation learning uh, in the context of supervised models already, um, where we've seen that if you train a, a classifier on ImageNet, for example, and then you chop off the last few layers, then the intermediate representations that this neural network learns uh, actually capture a lot of the details that are 
semantically relevant to us about the data. Uh, they learn to like separate dogs and cats well, or at lower level, they learn to separate uh, certain blobs of colors and, and different types of edges and textures well. Um, well, it turns out that we can use generative models to do sort of the same trick, uh, but without any ground truth labels. Uh, we can do this entirely in an, in an unsupervised setting where we don't have the labels saying this is a cat, this is a dog. All we have is a, a big data set of images. Um, and this is important because there are a lot of data sets in the world for which collecting those labels uh, is uh, very expensive or um, in some cases even impossible uh, because we don't know what they're going to be beforehand. Uh, so being able to learn good representations uh, entirely from unlabeled data is a very important task, and generative models are one way of getting about that. Um, so on the right, this is uh, representations learned on the MNIST data set uh, by a, a reasonably state-of-the-art generative model, uh, which we'll look into a little bit later. Um, but you can see that our generative model basically learns a, a mapping of each point of this, each point here is, is one picture of a handwritten digit, uh, and it learns a mapping of those digits into this low dimensional space, uh, but it's a space where uh, each different kind of digit is very neatly clustered into uh, its, its own region. Uh, the points are colored by uh, what kind of digits they are, so it's uh, the zeros and then the ones and then the twos and, and so on. Uh, the images on the right are another type of generative model uh, learning a representation um, in which it's, it's learned to separate out a lot of the uh, sort of factors that we consider semantically relevant about this data set. Uh, you can see um, the first picture, it's learned to uh, represent um, the idea that some of these digits are, are tilted to the left and then some of them are tilted to the right and it's learned to factor that out uh, of the variation in the data. Um, it's also learned uh, stroke width as a concept, that's the bottom image. Uh, we can see that it's learned to like map its images from uh, very, very thin strokes on the left to thicker strokes on the right. Uh, and then finally, of course, it learns digit identity as well. Uh, and the final thing that uh, I want to talk about in terms of getting generative models to understand data um, is that generative models, when trained correctly, uh, can be useful uh, in service of simulation, planning, uh, and, and things like counterfactual reasoning. Um, and eventually, we want to use this to build uh, intelligent agents and, and solve uh, machine intelligence in the general sense. Uh, if you think about uh, an agent operating in an environment, right, um, of which uh, you or I are good examples, um, one necessary component of this is that we all have sort of uh, models of our environment in our heads. Uh, we know what our world looks like and how it will respond. Um, we can predict several steps into the future. Uh, I know uh, what people's response will be if I say certain things, uh, or uh, if I let go of a pen, the pen will drop to the floor. Uh, I can ask myself uh, questions about hypothetical future scenarios, uh, like um, if I weren't to drop the pen on the floor, and if instead I were to throw it in the air, uh, when would it fall then? Um, and all of this uh, can actually be formalized in terms of uh, building a generative model of your world uh, conditioned on sort of the, the, the actions that you perform on it. Um, and then once we have this generative model, we can sample from uh, future possibilities, uh, or we can evaluate what the, the, the likelihood of this generative model generating a certain specific future is. Um, so the, the graphic on screen is uh, a group of researchers who applied this, this idea to predicting um, future frames of, of the Pac-Man video game conditioned on uh, what, uh, what buttons were pressed on the controller. Uh, and they built a predictive model that's able to learn uh, what the future several steps ahead looks like. Uh, and they're able to use this uh, in service of uh, being able to simulate and plan in the game. Uh, and if we think about the game as a, a sort of microcosm of the world in which we all operate, uh, then this is the relevance of generative models to uh, building sort of artificially intelligent systems down the road. All right, so that's a lot of motivation. Uh, let's talk for just a little bit about formalisms. Um, 
so far up until this point, uh, the picture of neural networks that we've had is as function approximators. Um, we have a training set, and this training set uh, basically has x, y pairs, uh, x belonging to some space and y belonging to some other space of outputs. Uh, and we try to learn a function that maps from the x's to the y's, uh, hopefully in a way that generalizes well. Um, the picture that we're going to talk about for generative modeling uh, is slightly different. Uh, now we still have a training set, but we only have the x's. Uh, so we have a, a training set of examples, um, x, and we're going to make an assumption. The assumption we make is that the training set was uniformly sampled from some underlying probability distribution. Uh, we'll call it p. And the goal of generative modeling, sort of the, the task that we're trying to achieve, uh, is to recover uh, an approximation that is as close as we can make it uh, to the underlying distribution that generated, or, or the underlying process that generated our training set. Um, and we want to recover an approximation to it that's as close as we can. Um, now, this implies that we need a metric for measuring uh, how close our model is uh, to this underlying distribution just given a bunch of samples from the, the true distribution. Um, we need a cost function. We need an objective. Uh, and the, the function we use is called max likelihood. Uh, and it is specifically that we're trying to maximize the joint likelihood of sampling every single thing from our training set uh, from this, this generative model that we build. Um, uh, and, and this translates to maximizing the product of the probabilities of every item in the training set under our model. Um, for reasons of uh, computational convenience, most of the time uh, we, we do this optimization in the log domain. So actually, we maximize a, a sum over the training set uh, of log probabilities rather than a product of probabilities. Uh, but it comes out to more or less the same thing. Uh, and then at generation time, when we want to uh, draw pictures of volcanoes or generate speech or, or uh, whatever you will, um, it's as simple as taking our model, our approximation to this probability distribution, and then drawing samples from it. Uh, so we can think of generation as sampling from a distribution. We can think of uh, learning as trying to fit a distribution. Um, and we can think of evaluating likelihoods or probabilities under this distribution uh, as estimating how, how realistic a certain data point is. So this is a picture of what this kind of looks like for a very simple data set and a very simple class of models. Um, this tries to fit uh, a, a mixture of a few different Gaussians uh, to a data set of points. Uh, you can see the points are there, they're the little dots, and you fit uh, the contour lines, which are the generative model that you end up learning to this. And it does a reasonably good job of capturing sort of the, the shape of this uh, distribution of data. Um, and it manages to pull out a few interesting factors, uh, which is it learns that the data is clustered around these four main regions, uh, and that each region has a, a variance in both dimensions. Um, and that's about the extent uh, that this, this generative model learns. But you can see it's captured basically a probability density function over this space. And if you were to sample from this density function, uh, you would get a series of points that look uh, not entirely unlike the series of points that it was trained on. So that works when you're trying to fit a, a very simple sort of model, like in that case, a mixture of Gaussians. Um, but for, for purposes of this lecture, we're interested, of course, in using neural networks uh, as our density functions, um, which uh, enable us to sort of model much more complicated distribution shapes over much higher dimensional spaces in a way that genera generalize, generalizes well, if we can do it. Um, so the first naive attempt might be, let's just try to learn this density function directly. Uh, let's train a neural network where you, you input a, a certain data point x, uh, and it outputs the likelihood of, of that value, uh, or the log likelihood, or, or whatever we want. Um, 
the problem that we quickly run into is if we train this with the max likelihood objective that we talked about earlier, um, then that's equivalent to taking each item in the training set, passing it through this neural network, uh, and telling it to push the probability up to one of that point. Uh, and so you'll get a network that just assigns uh, maximum probability to every point in the space, uh, which in fact makes it an improper probability distribution. Uh, because the characteristic of probability distributions uh, is that if you, uh, if you sum or integrate over the entire space of inputs, uh, the total probability over that space has to be equal to one. Um, and you're pushing up uh, certain points with this max likelihood cost function, uh, but there's nothing to enforce that everywhere else that you're not explicitly pushing up uh, gets pushed down. Um, the way that you typically would do this um, is you constrain your model. Uh, and the way you do that is you normalize every value by uh, that integral so that uh, the, the total integral over the space ends up being exactly one. Uh, you, you make your output some kind of ratio uh, where that integral ends up being in the denominator of the ratio. Uh, and so the integral ends up being one. Uh, but the problem is that for complicated neural networks, uh, this integral ends up being intractable. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's no closed form solution to it for, for most neural networks. And when your space is really big, like the space of like 64 by 64 pixel images or, or what have you, um, you can't efficiently approximate it by sampling either. Um, and so this, this ends up becoming a problem to formulating the problem this way. One solution uh, that people have come up with are a class of models called autoregressive models. Autoregressive models uh, tackle this, this problem of, of uh, the, the uh, normalizing constant in your probability distribution being intractable uh, by factorizing your distribution. Uh, so you take a, a complicated distribution over a large space, P of x, uh, and you factorize it dimension-wise uh, into first a distribution just over the first dimension, uh, and then a distribution over the second dimension conditional on the first, and then the third conditional on the first two, and so on uh, for all of the dimensions in your data set. Um, and what's cool about this is now, Every individual dimension uh, is a small enough space uh, that our normalizing constant uh, becomes tractable. Uh, either we can calculate it explicitly by summing over the whole space, or we can model that one dimension with a, a simple enough family of distributions that there's just a closed form solution to it. Uh, and we can define valid probability distributions over each of these individual dimensions. Uh, without having to do the whole thing at once. So there's the, the, the way we do this is we build one model. Uh, we'll call it a next step prediction model, uh, because in a lot of the data we care about, the dimensions are organized neatly uh, into, uh, into steps. So we build a model to predict the nth dimension um, or, or the nth time step, or the nth pixel, or, or whatever it is, because our dimensions tend to be ordered into this nice spatial or temporal structure. Uh, so we predict the nth uh, step conditioned on all of the previous steps. Uh, and we can, we can implement this as uh, an RNN, or as a convnet, or, or as any of the, the sort of neural architectures that you've learned already today. Um, if we're talking about uh, a, a discrete uh, space where uh, your, your, like your dimension uh, can take on a, a set of values like words or characters, um, then you typically use a softmax output on your network, and you just assign a probability explicitly to every option. Um, if you're talking about a continuous space like images, uh, Typically, what you'll do is you'll have your network output the parameters to a, a simple probability distribution, like a Gaussian curve. Uh, in this case, your, your network will output uh, a mu and a sigma. Um, and we'll have this, this, these two parameters define the distribution. Um, or uh, the second thing you can do in the case that you have continuous data is you can just uh, quantize your data into a bunch of, uh, a bunch of buckets. Uh, and now you're, you're back in the discrete case where you can just use a softmax. Um, and this actually works surprisingly well. We'll get into it a little later. Um, 
at generation time, the way you sample from an autoregressive model is you sample uh, uh, the, the first dimension. And then treating whatever you sampled as the ground truth, you sample the second dimension. And then you sample the third. Uh, and you go on in a chain uh, until, until you end up stopping, basically. Uh, so this is what this looks like. Um, You've actually already seen this slide before. Uh, this is the RNN language model that we talked about yesterday. Um, but now you get to see it in the context of generative modeling, because in fact, an RNN language model is uh, very much a generative model. Uh, at each step, it outputs a probability distribution over uh, words or characters or, or some other kind of token conditional on uh, everything that it's seen before. Uh, and you can generate from this uh, by uh, predicting a first word and then sampling from that softmax, uh, and then feeding that back into the network and having it predict the next word, and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, this trick doesn't have to be limited to generating language. Uh, we can also use it to generate images. Uh, this is some work that's fairly recent called Pixel RNN, uh, where they apply the same idea uh, in two dimensions. And they define uh, an RNN language model, basically, uh, that is autoregressive instead of over words in a sentence, over pixel values in an image. And uh, the, the two tricks that they use to make this work effectively are, first, they, they came up with a, an efficient formulation where they can train uh, uh, without they can, they can train this thing efficiently uh, by, by use of a series of, of convolutions that are constructed in a special way. Uh, and then the second thing that they did uh, is they chose to model each individual pixel not as a continuous value, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, just to quantize it into 256 possible values, uh, an, an eight-bit integer, basically. Um, and then uh, at each pixel and each color channel, uh, they just use a, a 256-way softmax layer uh, to predict the, the, the distribution over what that color channel is. Uh, and that lets them, in theory, uh, approximate a, any sort of arbitrarily complicated density function over this space. Uh, and you can see the generations don't really look globally coherent, uh, but they do a really good job of capturing the sort of finer structure uh, in data. They capture um, color and, and texture and those kinds of patterns really well. Um, so autoregressive models are, are powerful density estimators, to be sure, uh, but they have some problems. Uh, the first problem is, I mentioned, you have to generate in a sequence, one dimension at a time. Uh, and when you do this, it can be really slow. Uh, if we think about speech, for instance, uh, audio waveforms exist uh, as, as a sequence of, of pressure samples, basically, samples of, of the, the pressure wave. Uh, and there are about 16,000 of these samples in one second of, of speech speech quality audio, um, which means that if you want to generate even a very short sentence of speech, uh, you're talking about generating hundreds of thousands of samples sequentially, uh, which means hundreds of thousands of forward passes of a neural network, which is way too slow to do in real time. Uh, the second thing uh, that is troubling about autoregressive models uh, is that we want our networks, in a sense, uh, to reflect as closely as possible structurally uh, the, the the process that we think generated the data. Uh, by this, I mean uh, we don't want to generate a picture of a dog uh, by deciding on the value for the top left pixel, and then deciding on the value for the, the, the next pixel, and then the next pixel. Um, we ideally want to think about our models as uh, deciding on some high-level characteristics first. Uh, for instance, uh, is the dog standing up or sitting down? What kind of a dog is it? Uh, is it outdoors or indoors? Um, what, uh, um, what is its pose? Is it smiling? Uh, and having decided on all of these high-level high features, we want to sort of generate top-down from that uh, rather than sequentially in a chain. Uh, and because autoregressive models constrain us uh, to, to model architectures which are sort of unnatural in this sense, uh, they tend to focus uh, too heavily on aspects of the data that we don't care about. Uh, think again back to the pixel RNN picture, where uh, it does a really good job of modeling textures, uh, but there's no real global coherence to the images that get generated. Um, and then the final thing is we've talked about uh, the 
importance of representation learning and generative models applicability to that problem. Uh, but autoregressive models don't really have a very good uh, sort of internal representation that you can pull out. Uh, if, you, if you take the hidden layer activations of one of these models, uh, they don't really have any clear interpretability. So I want you to keep this picture in your head. Uh, of density estimation and of, of decomposing a distribution autoregressively. Uh, but I also want you to put it to the side for a little bit because I want to talk about a different class of model uh, that is not strictly a generative model uh, called an autoencoder. An autoencoder is a really beautifully simple model, actually, uh, for doing representation learning. Um, the idea when we've talked about representation learning in the past uh, is that you have some kind of classifier, say on ImageNet, where uh, at the bottom you, you pass in an image and you transform that image sequentially through a series of hidden layers. Uh, and then at the top you have a softmax and you have a loss function and you train this whole thing, forward pass, backward pass. Uh, and then you can take the activations from a certain hidden layer uh, and you find out that they are, are useful for a wide variety of tasks beyond what the classifier was originally trained from. Now, we're interested in doing exactly the same thing, uh, but we're operating in the unsupervised setting where we don't have access to any sort of class labels, uh, so we can't just put a classifier loss function on top. Um, so what we do instead with an autoencoder is we train it to do something very simple, uh, which, which on its surface might actually seem a little silly, uh, which is we train it to output exactly the same thing that we input. Uh, we train it to reconstruct its inputs. Uh, we put some inputs in, we pass them through a series of layers, and then the size of our output layer is exactly the size of our input layer, and the cost function we use uh, is just sort of mean squared error between the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and this forces the network to learn an identity function of sorts, where it just takes the inputs and it passes, through them, all, passes them through all these layers uh, and spits them out the other end. Um, and we'll take a certain hidden layer of this network, and we'll call it our latent representation. Uh, these are the, 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 the vectors that come out of this end are the features that we're interested in learning. Um, what autoencoders add to this picture is they take one of the layers and they make it very small uh, on, on the order of maybe a, a few dozen hidden units. Uh, much smaller than the space of the entire, uh, uh, than the, the original space of inputs. And what this means is that in order to do a good job of reconstructing, autoencoders have to be able to take their inputs and learn a representation of them that can compress them into uh, only, only a few hidden units here um, and then decompress them back out from that representation uh, into a reconstruction. Um, and it turns out that when we learn these compressed representations, uh, they tend to correlate very well with uh, the, the attributes of the data that we think are semantically relevant. Um, because in order to do this, the autoencoder has to sort of make decisions on what parts of the data are most important uh, and, and what's worth keeping around and what's a minor detail that we can throw out. Now, we, we, we talked about autoencoders as doing two things. They're a neural network with a reconstruction loss, and there's a bottleneck layer in the middle that forces uh, the network to compress its data. Um, I mentioned before that autoencoders were not generative models. Uh, this is true in the sense that you can't really interpret them as, as learning a, a probability distribution in a strict sense, uh, because you can't interpret them as doing compression in a strict sense. Uh, for instance, if your space of inputs is sufficiently small, uh, in fact, they can just learn an identity function. Um, but to the extent that they do compress their inputs, um, you can think of them as a sort of implicit generative model. Um, because there is a very interesting connection uh, between compression and generative modeling. Uh, that connection is that the way you do compression is by defining a, a, a probability model on the things that you want to compress. Uh, and in your compressed code, you, uh, you assign the shorter code words to the more likely data. Um, and in fact, the better you can model something, the better you can compress it. And the better you can compress it, the better you can build a density model of it. Uh, those two problems are basically sides of a coin. So based on this idea, um, there's a class of models called variational autoencoders. Uh, 
Uh, and variational autoencoders basically take this picture of an autoencoder that we've come up with, and they add some formalisms and add some extensions. Uh, they make everything probabilistic. They talk in terms, instead of a reconstruction loss uh, of, of outputting a certain restricted distribution uh, at the end and maximizing likelihood. Uh, and in doing all of this, I, I won't go through the derivation, but they managed to build a model that looks very much like an autoencoder, uh, but that has clear semantics as a generative model. Um, and it ends up learning better representations than a standard autoencoder. Uh, and interestingly, you can sample from this the, the, the density function that it learns now. Uh, so you can use it in all the ways that you can use a typical generative model, uh, even though it is, it is, in terms of its architecture, very much like an autoencoder. Uh, so these are some samples of faces generated from a, a state-of-the-art convolutional variational autoencoder. You can see it does a pretty good job of, of realistically learning the space of what, what faces might look like. Each of these tiny pictures uh, in the middle are actually interpolations between some of the bigger pictures. Um, so it, it learns to separate out a lot of the factors that are relevant in determining the appearance of an image, uh, which is uh, significantly better than uh, what the autoregressive models we were looking at earlier are able to do in terms of global structure. So this is, this is variational autoencoders when they work really well. Uh, but in fact, uh, the, the standard formulation as you implement it uh, tends to suffer from a few problems. Um, and this problem is that the encoder and the decoder tend to be uh, limited. Uh, I mentioned that VAEs um, output, they, they, they add probabilistic semantics, basically, to the entire autoencoder picture. Uh, and in doing so, uh, they define a sort of restricted class uh, of, of possible probab probability functions, uh, both in their encoder and their decoder. Um, they model the, the output of the encoder as, uh, as a, a diagonal covariance Gaussian as it is, uh, and they model the output of the decoder uh, in the same way conditioned on the output of the encoder. Um, and the problem with uh, these, these restricted families of distributions is that they're not able to capture all of the fine detail in images, and oftentimes you get generations that look really blurry like this. Um, and the problem with blurry generations is that uh, variational autoencoders have this interesting property that they do not encode uh, what is not useful for them to decode, uh, which means that if the decoder is not powerful enough to uh, generate uh, fine details like the texture of grass, uh, then the encoder will never get the right gradients to learn to encode features like the texture of grass into its representation. Uh, and so they end up being hindered for representation learning in the same way. So uh, the, the solution that people have come up with to this problem in VAEs is to take the autoregressive networks that we've looked at previously uh, and actually to use them both in the encoder and the decoder. So now you have a, a series of very flexible density estimators, and you're using them first to encode something into a compressed representation and then to decode from that compressed representation. Uh, and when you do that, you end up with uh, substantially more natural-looking images that have a very clear sense of, of global structure in them. Um, Many of these images are, are identifiable as, as something. Um, for the most part, it's, it's natural scenes. Uh, this is a, a autoregressive variational autoencoder trained on, uh, on the ImageNet data set, which is really challenging. We still haven't actually done a good job of being able to generate uh, a lot of plausible objects from that. Um, but this is, it's definitely a step improvement over either the variational autoencoder or the pixel RNN model that we looked at alone. So I'm going to touch on a fourth class, uh, or, or yeah, roughly a fourth class of generative models really quickly. Um, until now, we've been concerned with this idea of learning a density function. Um, and we've been sort of hamstrung by this idea uh, because we've been tackling the problem of, well, how do you parameterize this density function in a, in a nice way? Uh, and in order to do so, we've either had to uh, factorize it in a sort of awkward way, um, or we've had to resort to the tricks of variational autoencoders, which, uh, which use certain approximations and simplifications, which limits their, their capacity. Um, 
So this class of generative models is called generative adversarial networks. And generative adversarial networks sort of sidestep the problem of having to explicitly define a density function altogether uh, by implicitly de defining one. Uh, instead of defining a density function, which gives you the probability of any given point and from which you can sample, uh, they just give you a, a network which is capable of generating samples from some implicit density function, uh, but which never actually allows you to evaluate the function itself. Uh, the way this works is you have two networks. You have a generator network, uh, which takes in random noise um, from some distribution which will fix beforehand up front. Uh, and it takes uh, a sample uh, of that noise, and it transforms it through a bunch of hidden layers into uh, something that hopefully looks like an image, or a sentence, or audio waveform, or whatever you want. Um, and then you have a second network called a discriminator. And your discriminator's job is, at random, it is fed either a sample from your actual data distribution, or a sample from your generator network. Uh, and its job is to classify uh, whether the sample is a real image or whether it is generated. Uh, and in doing so, your discriminator ends up learning what the, the rules of the real image data set are that distinguish them from the generated image set. Um, and the way you train your generator is by maximizing the same cost that you're trying to minimize in your discriminator and just backpropagating the gradients all the way through from that loss through the discriminator and then backward through the image and through the generator. And so your generator learns to fool your discriminator and simultaneously you train your discriminator uh, not to be fooled by your generator. Uh, and these two networks, when you train them simultaneously, uh, play a sort of minimax game and hopefully, if you train it right, uh, that converges on a, a scenario where your generator is unable to distinguish the real from the fake inputs, and your generator generates inputs which look convincingly like the real data. So these are bedrooms generated uh, by a, a, a generative adversarial net. Um, you can see this is basically state of the art in terms of generating samples that are at once sharp uh, and coherent uh, and, and contain all of the characteristics of bedrooms that we're interested in, in representing. Um, and the pictures that I showed you earlier uh, of the birds and the ants and the volcanoes uh, are also from this process. Uh, because the only thing that the discriminator has to do is generate convincing looking samples, um, this training procedure biases you toward learning a model uh, which is really, really good at the task of generating convincing samples uh, rather than necessarily at, at estimating likelihood or covering all parts of the distribution uh, or things like that. So I'll, I'll try to conclude uh, by saying that if I can impress upon you one idea, through this presentation, uh, it's that we have a lot of models for doing generative modeling and unsupervised learning in general. Um, they all sort of have their drawbacks. Uh, we don't have a perfect model yet. This is very much an active area of research. Um, but we're going to need to be able to do a good job at it. Because if you think about the world that we exist in, uh, it's a world that has many orders of magnitude more unlabeled data than labeled. Um, if we think about the way we learn to recognize cats versus dogs, uh, actually, most of you probably did not sit down with, uh, with the ImageNet data set and look at a 1,000 labeled examples of cats uh, before you learn to distinguish what a cat is. Um, because we do a good job of leveraging the unsupervised data that comes in through uh, uh, our, our visual system every second. Um, and because we can leverage this data, we're able to learn the concept of a cat uh, having seen only one or two examples of a cat. Um, and if we want to build intelligent systems, we're going to have to figure out how to do this in a good way. Uh, and generative models are a promising path forward in that direction. So uh, I will finish with what I think is just a, a, like, I personally think this is a pretty cool example uh, of generative modeling. Uh, somebody trained a, a variant of a variational autoencoder, basically, um, 
conditioned on a description, uh, a one sentence description of a certain scene, uh, it learns to generate little thumbnail pictures of what that scene might look like. Uh, they trained this on a, a, a data set of uh, common objects and, and common scenes uh, that have captions provided for them. And then they evaluated this model by feeding it uh, some scenes which are highly implausible in the real world. Uh, they, they fed it a stop sign is flying in blue skies or a toilet seat sits open in a grass field. And lo and behold, the model is able to capture the meaning of these words and, and what they look like well enough that it does a kind of convincing job of generating uh, what a, a toilet seat sitting in a grass field might look like, even though it's almost certainly never seen this before. Um, and so it can generate these, uh, it, can, it can hallucinate or imagine or create uh, things which are almost certain never to have existed in the real world. Uh, and so if, if you want to be philosophical about it, you could say that this network is capable of generating dreams, uh, which I think is interesting. Anyway, that's all. Um, I'm here later if you have questions. Thanks, everyone.